Let's take a visit to the Old Testament. What is waiting for us there? Today, let's consider the book of Psalms. There are 150 of them. Most folks are familiar with Psalm 23, and that may be it. Is there depth and richness in the Psalms? Can spending time in the Psalms expand our understanding of the New Testament? Let's talk about the book of Psalms on this episode of Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathert with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Aaron, let's suppose that, other than Psalm 23, that I am largely unfamiliar with the Psalms. What have I been missing? Lots of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. There's um, the, the Psalms are the emotional and relational, spiritual center of God's Word, and by extension, the spiritual center and emotional and psychological center of relational center of God's people, too. The Psalms um, are all about our connection with the God who acts in history and um, and how we, as God's people, as individuals and as a community, actually experience it. And so it's, it's hugely important. So is there anything that sets the Psalms apart from from the rest of the books, I know there are historical books. There's Moses, his law, his Pentateuch, uh, the prophets. What category do we put the Psalms in? Well, the Psalms are, I mean, they're, they're kind of their own thing. They're, they're sometimes included in wisdom literature, although, you know, there's, a, there's a, quite a bit of difference between just, just reading. There's quite a bit of difference between Proverbs or Song of Solomon or the book of Job. I mean, they're poetry, right? That's the genre. But the Psalms are essential because I mean, the Bible, the story of the Bible, you know, God's mission to create a new family of of worshipers, people who worship and glorify Him, I mean, that actually comes, there's, there, that's actually exemplified and made manifest in, in the Psalms. And so... Um, it, it's different because it's it's actually it's actually God's people worshiping Him, and of course, there's people all throughout the Bible worshiping God, but this is the, it's just pure relate relating to God. So I think the Gospels are important. I think Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all important. How important are the Psalms? Where do they fit into the priority? of the Old Testament or New Testament for that matter. The priority. I that's it. I I that's an interesting question. The priority. Uh I guess the cheap easy answer is to say, well it's all God's word so it's all important. Uh clearly though we don't. That's that's not how we treat the Bible and, and probably rightfully so. We don't we spend more time in the Gospel of Luke than we do in the book of Obadiah for instance. So between Obadiah and the Gospel of Luke, where would the Psalms be? Um I don't know who who am I to like say on a scale of one to ten how important it is? I'm, I'm tempted to say ten, right? Um, based upon how often, based upon how big it is, based upon how often, let's go with this. Based upon how often the New Testament writers either quote or echo the Book of Psalms, I would say it's massively important. It's got to be a regular diet. massively, massively. It's got to be a regular diet of the Christian's uh, devotional consumption. Okay, I'm holding up my hand. Guilty as charged. I have to say, in the course of my lifetime, in my Bible reading, Psalms, not much. I have, in recent times, I mean the last few years, I set about reading all 150 of them, which I've done one time in my whole life. Other than that, it's sort of like dropping in and dropping out, mm -hmm. uh, probably because it's part of a Bible study or something. So I guess... Uh, I guess I get 50 lashes. Is that what I get? Because I didn't pay much respect to the book of Psalms? I don't think, it, I don't think relating to God works like that. Uh, he's offering you a, a delicious treat, and uh, I think that what he wants more to do than to, uh, lash you or punish you for not reading is say, hey, come join in. This is really good stuff. Delicious is an interesting word. Why do you, why do you use that word? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was subconscious. God's word, uh, the book of Psalms says in a couple different places, is sweeter than honey. Maybe that's where I was going with that. Like knowing God, knowing his word, spending time 
in meditating upon his word as as a part of relating to him actually is delicious and that's you know I didn't actually didn't mean to say that I was just probably trying to be cute a little bit but there's a lot in the psalms about God and his word both of the but God and his word being delicious Psalm 34 taste and see that the Lord is good uh, this is uh, delicious is actually a decent word is not really intending it to be but it actually it actually works here in Luke 24 Jesus is quoted as saying these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled it's a no brainer for the law and the prophets but I was kind of surprised that Jesus elevated the Psalms into that company, the uh, writings of Moses and the prophets. Yeah, the, the Psalms. So I, I don't know why we have this impression of the Psalms as being kind of a, uh, I don't know, I don't know what we think of them as. It's like kind of shallow and a little bit too, not, not meaty and in depth, you know. But the Psalms, I mean, that's there's a reason why, this is going to take a couple minutes too to say this, but there's a reason why Jesus puts the Psalms in the Law and the Prophets, and that's because, you know, what the Law and the Prophets, Jesus' point there when he's talking to those two guys on the road to Emmaus, his point is that the Law and the Prophets tell the story of which Jesus himself is the fulfillment. And the Psalms are the exact same way. The Psalms, I mean, here's the, here's the great thing about the Psalms. Like, So on the surface, we can talk about uh, the Psalms as um, corporate worship. We can talk about the Psalms as as Tim Keller describes them, God's counseling casebook. It's not necessarily a textbook for how to counsel, but when you think about all the range of emotions that the psalmist, just David himself, experiences from almost depression, it looks like, to exaltation and everything in between, you can think of it as um, uh, you can think of it as uh, uh, theological truths that we're called to meditate upon. There's some psalms that aren't exactly prayers, but we're, we're, we're called to, uh, you know, it gives us some um, some bit about God's personality and his character and his actions in the world that we're called to meditate. You know, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's not a prayer. It's just a call to meditate on God and who he is and what he's done for us. So all that stuff is on the surface, and the temptation, I think, is to probably think, well, okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I can do all that stuff. I can read you know, Romans and uh, Deuteronomy and do all that stuff. But what the Psalms together, it's huge, the biggest book in the Bible, right? The Psalms together tell the story of redemption, the story that Jesus is telling the two disciples on the road to Emmaus get told by the Psalms. And this is something that I mean, the Psalms, maybe it's because they're so big that it's hard to notice this, but the Psalms are divided up into five books. There are five separate books in the Psalms, and um, they each run about you know, 30, 40 Psalms, and then it says, you know, end of book one, here's the beginning of book two. And those, the, those, the way the Psalms have been arranged by whoever it was that edited these Psalms, somebody during the Babylonian exile probably, has been ranged to tell this wonderful, incredible story of, of the failure of God's people, the loss of the king, the hope that God would once again return and live with his people again. The, the way the, these five books are arranged tell this story. And let, let me just run through this real quick if I can. So the first book, it's like Psalm 1 through uh, Psalm 40-something, and it's a lot of Psalms of David and a lot of psalms, I mean, there's some struggling in there, but there's also a lot of psalms that are just praising God for who he is. Psalm 23 is in there. That's famous, right? Uh, you get Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is so important, this psalm where um, the the kings of the earth are uh, trying to get out from underneath the yoke of Yahweh, the creator God, and his Messiah, but God laughs at them and says, I'm going to blow you up unless you kiss the son, kiss the Messiah, who is at the time, is it, you know, right, David. Well, then, then you get to Psalm, you get to the second book of the Psalms, and starting with uh, Psalm 40 or something like that, and then it becomes slowly, progressively darker, and things are, things are going poorly. At the very end of book two, the very last line in book two, 
which is uh, Psalm 72, the very last line is, uh, thus ends the Psalms of David. And it's done. David's gone. Thus ends the Psalms of David. So uh, then you go to Psalm 73, starting book three. I'm so, it, I wish I had a graph or a PowerPoint slide I could show our listeners at home so it doesn't get too, too, uh, uh, um, too confusing. But in, in, in book three, it's incredibly dark. There are a few Psalms in there where there's absolutely no hope. God, where are you at? Why have you abandoned us? Why have you not watched over your people? Ending with the, the fantastic Psalm 89, which is basically an entire psalm devoted to God abandoning his king. The king is gone. David's, David's Remember, David's gone at the end of book two. And in Psalm 89, there's the, uh, the, 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 the kingdom's over. Israel is, they've been exiled, they're in Babylon, and the whole story is ended in heartbreak and despair and empty hope, hopelessness. Well, okay, book four, what do you know? David shows back up. More Psalms from David. After we're told at the end of book two that David, uh, the Psalms of David has ended, have ended, in book four, more Psalms from David showed up. And there's this hope that starts to spring forth there. There's a group right in the middle of there in the in the 100s of, of ascent psalms, psalms that are devoted to walking up to the temple to worship God. Well, remember, at the time that these are being uh, collected and edited, the temple's gone. It's been destroyed. And so whoever it is that's gathered these psalms have put these ascent psalms right here as this token. Ascent that, psalms? The ascent walking up the stairs into the temple. Okay. That's why they're called that. And um, has put these psalms here as this sort of testimony that the temple will be once again rebuilt, and God will come back and live with his people again. Lift up your head, O you gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. God is going to come back home. Well, when you get to book five, it's just, especially right at the end, it's just pure praise, all of creation praising God, all of, na all of nature, every human, every nation praising God. And so you put all those together, and what the Psalms do is they tell the story of the Bible. Here's, here's the Davidic king at the beginning. God's promise to rule over his creation through his Messiah. There's the failure of the kingdom and the loss of David, the loss of the kingdom. Now Babylon's in charge, and it's bleak and it's hopeless. But then all of a sudden, David comes back, and everything starts to get better again. It starts to look up. God's moving back in so his people can worship him in person. And then at the end, this brilliant vision of new creation with everything being set back to right and everything in the entire world turning with one heart to worshiping the one true God. And so when Jesus meets those disciples on the road to Emmaus and basically says, hey, the book of Psalms, that's about me. He, what, he, what I believe he's doing is he's, sh he's saying, I'm the new David. I'm the David that comes back in book four. I am the king of glory entering into the gates. I am the one who's leading us to this universal worship of the one true God in the new creation. I remember, I it's been a long time ago, but one of the most profound impacts that scripture reading ever had on me was when I stumbled upon Psalm 22. Yeah. Uh, who goes to Psalm 22 when Psalm 23 is right next door? You right. know, let's just go to the Lord is my shepherd. But in Psalm 22, we find the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you're paying even casual attention around Good Friday or during the Lenten season and you come in contact with Jesus on the cross saying these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, it evokes a kind of a dark and foreboding and sad, For sure. almost disastrous yeah. kind of a feel, which is understandable. He's an innocent man and he has been tortured and he is being killed. Yeah. And then, thinking that's the end of that story, I find out he's quoting Psalm 22. Right. And my brain says, well, there's more going on than just the Son of God dying on the cross here. He seems to be trying to communicate something mm -hmm. by quoting from Psalm 22 as he's dying. Am I reading too much into that, or is there deeper meaning there to be to be drawn out. Oh yeah, Psalm 22. I'm glad you brought that up. Psalm 22 is so great because I I don't think that Jesus is like, "Hey, I'm going to quote this and send a subliminal message." I think that he is so filled up on 
the word of God that like when he is abandoned by the Father, carrying our sins upon his shoulder, this is the, this is, comes right out of the depths of his heart. This my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But but the reason why it does is because he has lived and breathed Psalm twenty two. And Psalm 22 is so rich. It's so fa- it's fascinating, first of all, because you're right, it starts off with this, whoever it is that's talking here, it's David in Psalm 22, Jesus applies it to himself. And of course, um, I don't want to be repetitive here, but the reason why Jesus is linked to David is because you know, David is the first Messiah and Jesus is the final greater Messiah. But God has abandoned him on the cross. David feels abandoned in Psalm 22. And there's lots of stuff in here that's that's brought up in the uh, New Testament too, referencing um, referencing Jesus's crucifixion. They open wide their mouths at me. I'm poured out like water. All my bones bones are out of joint. Um, dogs encompass me. A company of evil doers. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. There's all this stuff that that the gospel writers are telling the story of Jesus being crucified. And it's not just that Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The gospel writers also want us to see other contact points so that we go to Psalm 22 to understand what's going on at the crucifixion, which is this. Here's the main point. Jesus knows, David knew, because they both filled up on Psalm 22 and other texts in the Psalms and in the prophets, that the path to glory is the path of suffering. That God abandoning his chosen one is not the end, but it's the means by which he accomplishes his greater mission of rescuing the creation back to himself. So, like you pointed out, Psalm 22 starts off just dark and cold and empty. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it takes a sharp turn right in the middle of the psalm. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to Yahweh, and he rules over the nations. Posterity shall serve him, it shall be told of the Lord of the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. So when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is pulling in this story. We're in Psalm 20. So Psalm 22 starts off with God being forsaken, and it ends with all the nations of the earth coming and worshiping. Is that that like some bipolar, sort of like the psalmist like was writing this horrible psalm and like finished because he just couldn't, couldn't go on that day. And he woke up the next morning and he was feeling great. And he thought, well, I'll finish the psalm. You know, and he's like... Well, it felt it. No, he's at the point he's trying to make, though, is that God forsaking his Messiah is going to end up with the nations of the world coming and worshiping him. And Psalm, I'm glad you brought that up, Chuck. Psalm 22 just captures that beautifully. So, from the New Testament book Ephesians in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes, quote, Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So what should we be doing to honor Paul's admonition? When, are you, when I encounter you walking down the street to uh, local community, I wave at you and say, the Lord is my shepherd and I'm, I'm okay, or is there some other meaning to this? Well, if you did that, that would be entirely appropriate, right? Um, I think most of the time this gets applied to Christian worship, corporate Christian worship, which is, um, that's a fine that's a fine way to apply it, is that... Um, what does he say? Um, ad- ad- addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, when I'm singing in church, uh, when I'm singing by myself, I guess too, like the, temp- the you know one of the things that we or in a group of friends, um, you know one of the things that we think of is like we're pra- we're praising God, right? But not just here in Ephesians five, but elsewhere too. You know, Paul says. Uh, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That I, I need to hear my Christian brothers and sisters singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is an advertisement for uh, better singing in church. Um, and um, you know, the reason being that I need to hear it. It teaches me when my Christian brothers and sisters sing God's word and sing spiritual songs and hymns, it actually builds me up and encourages me in the faith. 
And I know I, I talk about this with people at our church, and sometimes they'll say, well, I don't have a very good voice. And that's really not the point here. The point isn't like, the, the point is not the, um, the, the point isn't the, what's the word I'm looking for here? The demonstration of your musical skill. The point is me needing to hear God's word and spiritual songs and hymns sung. And so we, we probably need to do a better job of singing more, more psalms. There's, you know, some, a lot of churches have uh, hymns that are psalm settings. Um, I, some of the Reformed churches insist that you should only sing psalms. And um, you can see some of their hymn books will be just psalms that have been set to, uh, you know, contemporary modern poetry. And um, that's pr- probably taking it too far because we're also instructed to sing hymns and spiritual songs too. But we probably do a, need to do a better job of singing the psalms in church. If we're going to do a better job of singing the psalms or just singing in general, we should probably want to do that. And I think what you described before, well, I'm not a very good singer, or I, Pastor, you don't want to hear me sing because it's all, that might be the prevalent view. Uh, singing is good. Let's let the good singers sing. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just not muddy up the water. Right. But I, I hear you saying that's not the right attitude. I'm not even sure if we've asked that question. Yeah. Uh, whether we've put enough stress on singing the word of God. I mean, you know, the hymn books are there. Right. The hymns are chosen. Yeah. Sing if you want to. That's, right. That's not the right attitude, yeah. is it? No. I mean, we're commanded to do it. And if, if, um, you, maybe this is one of the reasons why we don't like the Psalms, or, or we don't pay enough attention to them. I should. Nobody's going to say they don't like the Psalms. No Christian's going to say that, at least, is because they're poetry, right? And there's this sort of it's kind of weird poetry, like who, you know, you want to come over to my house and read poetry together? You know, who does that, right? And so, let's do something more serious, like Deuteronomy or the Book of Galatians or something like that. But singing is commanded. It's also it's going to we, we need to force ourselves to do this because. Um, some of us were talking about this the other day here at church in a Bible study that um, singing is no longer something people do. It used to be uh, before you could, you know, turn on Spotify and listen to some tunes. It used to be uh, back before uh, even uh, tapes or records. You know, if you wanted music, you, you made your own music. You know, and houses had pianos and people learned how to sing parts, and that's how you accessed music. Now, of course, you don't need to do that if you want to access music. You can you know, open up YouTube or um, Pandora or Amazon Music or whatever, you know. And so we are going to have to fight against that as Christians. And not that it's evil. I'm not, of course, I'm not saying at all that it's evil to listen to music on Spotify, but not being able to make music when we're instructed to make a joyful noise to the Lord, that's something we're just going to have to continue to force ourselves to work on. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's a jam-packed sentence right there. And and it just sort of reinforces what we've been saying about singing. Does singing, either at home or in church, increase the richness of God's Word dwelling in me? Um, Does it advance my gratitude, my thankfulness, uh, just because it's singing? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so this is for, this isn't for everybody who's listening right now, but for those of you who go to a church like mine, you'll know that the temptation is to think that the real good stuff is the doctrinal stuff. We want teaching. We want deep, rich theological teaching. And of course, that's true too. My, My type of church tends to, I mean, it's true, absolutely true. My type of church tends to attract somebody who's more interested in the intellectual aspects of Christianity. It's vitally important. Like, there's tons there. And a church like mine probably struggles with the emotional aspects of what it means to know and be known by God. Knowing God isn't just knowing information. It's also experiencing Him in a way that makes me feel things. And that's what the Book of Psalms does, is it calls us into this full-bodied emotional relationship. Like I, if I, I, I think I've said this in here before, like if, if my relationship with my wife consists of learning facts about her, it has not yet gone deep enough. 
if I'm not spending time with her, if I don't feel feelings for her, it's not deep enough. Now, you, you can't go to the, the other side either and just say that the feelings are the most important. No, we need to be reading uh, Deuteronomy and Romans and Galatians and all that good stuff because it's not an either or. But the Psalms definitely pull you into this experience where you are living life with the God that Galatians describes, that Deuteronomy describes. You're living life with him in your own personal existence, which means sometimes heartbreak. Uh, I, I cry all night long, David says. Sometimes it just means like exaltation, like not being able to... And, and, and in the Psalms, there's every emotion in between as well, all centered around God and who he is and his character. So yeah, I think this is one of the reasons why we do read the Psalms and we do want them uh, in our as a regular part of our devotional life is because we need that aspect of what it means to be a child of God too. So in our church, as we work our way through the liturgy, frequently it happens toward the beginning of the service where there is a reading from a mm -hmm. Psalm or a portion of a Psalm. There it is. And so we often read it responsively. Everybody's involved. And I can't think of any reason not to do that, but I'm not sure what the reason is that we do do that. Why, right. why is that a vital part of the worship service? Yeah, so it's, it's again, to go back to what we talked about earlier, the Psalms are telling the story of Jesus. The text you just read from Paul, he calls it the word of Christ. That, that can either be the word that Christ says or the word about Christ. It can be either one of those. So, so, and, and the Psalms, by the way, are, the, are, are both. Psalm, the Psalms are you know, telling the story of Jesus in the big picture, like I pointed out earlier in the five books, but also an individual Psalm. I mean, the Lord, Lord is my shepherd is about Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd, John 10 says. Um, lots of Psalms that are specifically messianic about Jesus. So that's why it's in Christian worship. The reason why it's in Christian corporate worship, why we see what, why we, uh, read psalms together every Sunday, and some churches actually sing the psalm every Sunday, is because the psalms are the corporate worship book of God's people. That's our corporate, that's our that's our first baseline hymn book, is the book of psalms. And so um, as part of the Christian liturgy, and this has been the case for thousands of years, the psalms are regularly read and sung, pulling us into that story about Jesus with God's people across the ages, even going back into the time of Israel and David. So I mean, it's that's a good thing to think about too when we read that psalm is that somebody 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago was reading this exact same psalm, singing this psalm in worship, and now I'm joining with them and I'm doing it in reference to the Savior that the psalms talk about and who is here now in our presence. Toward the beginning of our conversation today, you I think you included the Psalms among those books in the Old Testament, which are often referred to as wisdom literature. Mm -hmm. I know there's a difference between the way we use the word wisdom in the world and the way we use the word wisdom in the church, kind of the, the way there's a difference between faith as used in the world and faith as used in the church. And so if you bring your worldly understanding of the word wisdom into your church experience, it's, I think you're going to wind up in the weeds. So what is it about the word wisdom as we understand it in the context of the kingdom of God, and how does that fit with the Psalms? So like I said, I, I don't know if like Psalms is the best example of what we call wisdom literature, and that sounds horrible. Like, I mean, the Psalms are full of wisdom, right? Proverbs is kind of the heart of wisdom literature, which is knowing God, being in right relationship with God, how now do I act? How do I make choices in individual situations? How do I do what the right thing is? So knowledge is one thing. You know, We should be getting knowledge by studying God's Word. And wisdom, though, is like taking that knowledge of God's Word and living life in light of God's Word, in light of the Bible. And of course, the Psalms, the, the Psalms do that too. Less overtly than Proverbs, there's not a lot of Psalms that say, do this, walk this way, act like this in this situation. But but it falls into that. It falls, so you, reading the Psalms, and especially when it comes to our emotional life and our corporate life, 
reading the Psalms and knowing that like when my heart's breaking, I can go to God. My parents may abandon me, but God will never abandon me, the Psalms say. And you know, it's, you don't have too many more relationships that are more intimate than that. When I'm going through, when I'm being, um, when I'm being talked bad about by my enemies, uh, when I'm lonely, when I'm in physical pain, there's a lot of this. When I feel like God has abandoned me, when I feel the presence of God, when I'm with my friends, when I'm overjoyed at the beauty of God's creation, how do I respond? What do I do in those situations? Well, Psalms has all of those instances in spades. And to, to go there, and the interesting thing about this too is that um, frequently in those scenarios, we don't know what to say. Like, you know, you're abandoned or you found out that you're terminally ill and there really aren't words in places, or sometimes we as Christians, we just don't know what to pray for, period. The Psalms are a great place to go because there's prayer, there's worship, there's meditation for all these instances ready-made for us. So here's my last question, but it's a two-part question. For the person who is listening to us who admits, yeah, I don't have much familiarity with the Psalms at all, not hardly at all. This information about books one through five, that's all brand new to me. I didn't even know that. And so I've been coming up with excuses not to really go to the Psalms for a long time now that I think about it. I'm going to give you two, and, and I'd like your reaction to it. One is being a Western thinker. Uh, I, I like linear things. I like things that have a beginning, a middle, an end. I can identify those. I know where I am in the process from point A to point B. The Psalms don't feel like that to me. They sort of feel like they're all over the board, like darts all over the wall that have been thrown by the dart thrower. And that's a problem for me. I like that progress moving forward kind of reading. What would you say? Well, I'd say I'd read it in the five books. Read it in the story that the Psalms themselves tell, the story of uh, the kingdom that God promised to David, starting in Psalm uh, 2, and then uh, the loss of that kingdom, the despair that comes with the hopelessness of the king that God promised would reign over the house of Israel forever is now gone, and then the sight of the king returning and the temple being rebuilt and God coming back home. The, the Psalms, and then finally, new creation. The Psalms tell a linear story. They tell the story of the Bible compacted into 150 Psalms. The story of promise, the story of loss and failure, the story of restoration, the story of renewal and new creation. And if, if linear is your thing, like if narrative is your thing, if I want to know that I'm headed towards a goal here is your thing, then jump into the Psalms, but read them not as isolated Psalms, but as a part of a larger unit. And the second objection or excuse, probably a better word, is there are 150 of them, Pastor. I mean, if I start reading 150 Psalms, I won't be back to my favorite New Testament books, you know, for six months or something like that. It's just too long. It's too much of a commitment. What would you say? Well, um, read more. Like, it's, you know, so you can, you're allowed, I beg your pardon. You're allowed to read Romans in the Psalms too. I mean, the good thing about the Psalms is that they're, most of them are shorter. It doesn't, it doesn't take a long time to read Psalm 23, right? Um, so you don't need to sit down and read them all at once, but just start reading them and make it a regular part. It ta It's going to take you all of, usually it's going to take, you know, seven, eight minutes to read three Psalms. Just start making it a regular part of your worship life. I heard somebody the other day who, um, listening to somebody, a podcast the other day, somebody reads through the Psalms once a month, which is five Psalms a day. That's, you know, is that right? Is my math right? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's easily doable. And to get caught up in there. And so, like, Again, reading the Bible, reading the Psalms is like talking to your kids or talking to your best friend or talking to your spouse. You're not necessarily looking for new information. The payout of those of reading the Psalms, like the payout of talking to your kids or your mom or your best friend, is doing it over and over and over again starts to tell its own story, starts to create its own relationship. 
So I wouldn't suggest, I would just suggest start off small. If, you, if you've not read the Psalms before, start off, but do it regularly. Make it a regular part, and you'll, you'll find as you go along that your sense of who God is and how he relates to you in your everyday existence is much more rich and much more deep and much more emotionally and intellectually nuanced. As a pastor of your own people, is it important to you that those people whom you shepherd are into the Psalms? Oh, yeah. Vitally important. Our our youth group led us about a year ago on this sort of, um, um, you know, personal commitment to read one psalm a day. And I I can't think of a whole lot more that you could be doing devotionally that would be more valuable for your soul than doing that. All right. I will take your encouragement with a positive attitude. And uh, that is our discussion today on the Old Testament Book of Psalms. We want to say thank you for listening to Craving Answers, Craving God with Aaron Miller, pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. We encourage you to share your thoughts with us. You can enter your questions and comments on our website at stjamesglencarbon.org. Click contact us, leave your message there. I'm Chuck Rathert. Thanks for listening.